born-again believers, we know what it is to have God work in our lives to give us new life, but it's something altogether different when we say, Lord, I'm available. Here I am, send me. And so that's one of the reasons why we receive the gift for Christ. We have made commitments to partners around the world who are there spreading the gospel, and it's, and it's our job to support them, to come alongside and to help them. So be praying about your gift this year for the gift for Christ and also about your participation. Uh, go by and get one of those booklets. Look at a, a, a potential trip for you, uh, for your small group, maybe, maybe your family, and, and consider going and serving this year. I'm going to pray for that now and also pray for our time in God's Word. So let's pray together. Lord, you are good, and we're so grateful for the men and women who've gone on mission, living on mission in, in faraway places, some of them, seeking to take the gospel where, where it's never been. And we pray, God, that you would, you would make us to be faithful to support them, to go where they are, to come alongside and help. And so, Lord, bless the gift for Christ and, and bless this message today as we as we seek to understand how it is, God, we, we are to serve even, even when we doubt. Help us, God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We, we are, we're in the series, we're, we're talking about thriving even when we doubt. And it's so important to understand if you're a serious Christian, you're going to struggle with doubt. You're going to go through things that are going to cause you to doubt. There's going to be feelings that, that hit you. that are going to create doubt. But here's what you got to know. God uses doubt to strengthen our faith. Uh, one friend said that, that doubt is a frenemy. Are you familiar with that term, frenemy? Doubt is a frenemy, a friend who often acts like an enemy. Doubt, strangely enough, is a friend. It just, it really depends on your perspective. How do you look at doubt? How do you approach it? While, while the devil uses doubt to destroy us, what does God do? God can use doubts to develop us. Doubts can deepen our dependence on God. Doubts can drive us uh, out of complacency as we eagerly search for answers. Doubts can cultivate Christian humility within us. Doubts can help us relate to other doubters with compassion. Jude even reminds us to have mercy on those who doubt. Doubts can equip us to, to be sharper Christian apologists in our quest for answers. Doubts can help us grow in Christian discernment as we sift through what to believe and what not to believe. Doubts can serve as a necessary reminder that our battle is not against flesh and blood. The root of this soul war is spiritual, and it's very powerful. Indeed, doubts can create in us a greater longing for heaven, for that day when our doubts will vanish. What we're looking to do in this series is to identify our doubts and to learn how we can overcome them, and to see how God uses those doubts to push us forward into our faith. We're studying some small books of the Old Testament. And these little books have a big wallet. They have a huge impact if we have eyes that can see and ears that can hear. And our text today is, is, is very powerful. Our text today speaks to the reality of the fact that we can serve even when we have doubts. Now, when I talk about serving, I want to give you a definition. Serving is joining God by using our spiritual gifts and natural abilities to care for people and expand God's kingdom. Serving is not doing what we want. It's doing what God's called us to do. It's joining in. We don't have to create something. It's joining in what God is already doing with the gifts he's already given, natural abilities, spiritual gifts. And again, it's, it's helping people. It's expanding God's kingdom. Oftentimes, what we want to do is we want to wait till we feel ready. We want to wait until we feel like we've got it all together and we know what the outcome's going to be and we know that we're going to be good at it and, and that, that then, you know, then I can serve because after all, I've got it all figured out. But friends, that's not thriving. Remember the definition for thriving? Thriving is having the confidence to be intimate with God and the contentment to obey God's commands while trusting outcomes to God's capable care. Serving God is being intimate with God. It's joining God in what He's doing. And it's trusting the outcome to his, his capable care. God's not telling us to, to come up with something to do. God is already at work in the world. He's calling us to join him with what we have, with where we are, and to trust him to produce the outcome. I, I am such a huge fan, and you guys know this, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. As a matter of fact, they're going to be having a dinner on November the 4th that I would encourage you to attend and hear more about this powerful ministry. It's, it's important to me. This ministry is important to me because when I was... Um, when I was a new Christian, the leadership of FCA reached out to me. I, I, I didn't know a lot about the Bible. I didn't know a lot about God, but I knew I was saved. 
and they, they gave me some tools. They, they gave me a Bible with some Bible studies and devotions in it. They gave me a sweatshirt with the FCA logo on it. And uh, they gave me a plan for the whole calendar year of, of what FCA meetings should be like. And I was so grateful when the regional director actually came to our first meeting. And he shared the gospel and he preached. And a couple of my friends got saved, a couple of the guys on my, on my ball team. And I thought, you know what? I think God's in this. I don't know what I'm doing, but God does. And God's in this. And God led me to, to continue to be a part of that. And it, it was one of the foundations of my faith. It was the, certainly one of the foundations of my callings in Christ because I stepped up to do something that I felt in no way capable or prepared to do. It's kind of the same way I felt at the age of 28 when you called me to be your pastor. No way was I old enough. No way was I ready for this responsibility. But you know what? God was. And that's something to remember. We may not feel ready when God's ready. But when God's ready, all we have to say is, yes, Lord, here I am. Send me. And God will equip you. God will show you. He'll give you the next steps. He is so faithful. He's not looking for us to create something to do. He's looking for us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to turn our eyes on Jesus and to follow Jesus and to, to work where he has called us to work and to be where he's called us to be. Again, serving is not doing what we like to do or what we think we're going to be successful at. It's, it's joining God and what he's already doing, using our gifts, our natural abilities, helping people and expanding God's kingdom. And our text today, it helps us understand how that looks and what it is we need to be doing as we seek to serve God. Uh, the book that we're going to be in is Esther. So if you've got your Bible, and I do hope that you do, let's go now to this little Old Testament book. We've been in Nehemiah all year, so hopefully your, your Bible is already bent towards that, that section of Scripture. Uh, Esther is right after Nehemiah. And we're going to go to ne I'm sorry, Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Let's all stand together in honor of God's word. Ellie is going to come, and she's going to read our scripture for us again. We're in Esther chapter 4, and this is verses 13 through 17. Read that for us, sweet girl. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you've not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told him to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. Amen. If you would be seated. Well done, Ellie. Pray now for the preaching of God's word. Something fascinating about the book of Esther. Nowhere in the book does it mention God. You will not see the word God anywhere in the book. But you will see the handiwork of God throughout it. It's very much like our lives. We will rarely most of us will never see God but we will see the results of God we will see the impact of God at work in the world it's it's crucial that we understand the context of Esther uh, where and when it was Esther became queen in 478 BC that probably doesn't mean a lot to you but let me put it in context it's after the exile between the return of the Jews to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple in 516 BC and when Nehemiah went to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem in 444 BC. So we've been studying this. We studied when Cyrus called God's people back to Jerusalem. We read about that in Ezra and then Nehemiah later came back, you know, several decades later to build the walls around Jerusalem. And so Esther's right in the middle of those from the call to build the temple to when the walls were rebuilt. Esther had a responsibility to serve God's purpose during that time. And it was an important purpose. God was calling on her to, to seek the salvation of the Jews. See, the devil hates the Jewish people. 
He hates them for many reasons. One in particular is because God promised that he was going to bring the Messiah through them. In Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham that through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so the devil has always hated young men. As you'll, if you'll remember in the Exodus, it was two-year-olds and younger that were mercilessly murdered by the Pharaoh. If you'll remember in, in the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, all the two-year-old males and younger were murdered. Why? Because the devil's terrified of this promised male who would come, who would redeem the world. Not only had God promised Abraham this, uh, later uh, King David was promised. King David, David in the line of Abraham from Abraham's family. 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David that the Messiah would be born through his family line. And so throughout the Old Testament, we find the devil trying to destroy and to decimate the Jewish people. And this is one of those moments. The book of Esther is about how God used this beautiful woman, this young woman, to lead and to provide for the salvation of God's people. One of the things we got to get is the sense of the whole story. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and spoil, spoil, spoiler alert. How do you say that word? Spoiler alert. Um, they win. Okay, just to, so you know the story. on it. Let's do a quick overview because I want you to get the story. So go back to chapter one. I'm not going to read it. I just want to give you an overview of the story. Go back and read it in its entirety today if you have time. It's such a blessing. Again, you will not see the name God, but you will see the hand of God at work. So in chapter one, we see Vashti, the previous queen, uh, being denounced and exiled because she, she would not come before the king, which leaves a vacancy. In chapter two, we're introduced to Mordecai and Esther. Esther and Mordecai are cousins, but Mordecai is raising her as his daughter. And she wins the beauty contest and she becomes the queen. So in, in, in chapter 3, we, we see this, uh, this, this movement of God where Haman begins to be at work. Uh, but before that, I always skip this part. Look in verse 19 through 23 in chapter 2. It's a very important swing moment in the story, a bit of foreshadowing. Mordecai would, would consistently sit at the gate. He was looking after Esther, making sure she was okay. And on one of those occasions, he heard about a plot uh, that two men had to kill the king. So he reported that to Esther. Esther reported to the king. It was discovered. Those, those uh, men were punished, and, and the king's life was saved. And if you'll notice in verse 23, it was recorded in the chronicles of the king. There was a story that, that was recorded. That's important uh, for, for later in the story. So in chapter 4, it was a very volatile moment that, that Mordecai instructs Esther now to inter intervene on behalf of the Jews. Haman, if you'll see in chapter 3, had decided that he hated the Jews and he wanted them all dead. And so she had to step up and she had to serve and, and God provided. Now in chapter six through 10, you see the, 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 again, the resurfacing of Mordecai and his leadership, because as, as it would, ha as it would happen to happen, we know this was providence. The king couldn't sleep one night. And so in order to, to have something to do, he had to read the book of Chronicles where the story of Mordecai was reported to him so that there could be a blessing brought to Mordecai that could bring about the absolute total salvation of God's people and the destruction of God's enemies. It reminds me of the coming of Jesus Christ, how death held him but could not hold him. And through his resurrection, he was rescued and death was destroyed. And now there is freedom for God's people. There is a beautiful picture of the gospel in, in this story. But what we want to focus on is how it was this, this beautiful woman, this young woman, was called upon to serve God and intervene to save God's people. Now, she had a lot of doubts. She, I mean, she knew that she didn't have permission to go to talk to the king. She knew she had no right to speak to the king. And she knew that she would probably suffer and die if she did step into this situation that, that Mordecai was calling her to. And it may very well be today, you've already decided in your mind, you know, I know he's talking about serving, but I've got, no, I've got reasons I can't. Maybe you're a lot more like Esther than you think. You think you've already got it figured out what you can and can't do. Can I tell you, God is bigger than anything you will ever face. Any of your doubts, any of the challenges, any of the obstacles that you perceive to be in the way of you being able to serve God's purpose for your life. Friends, God is bigger. Trust God. Lean in to what God can do, not what you can do. Remember what serving is? It's joining God. 
in using your gifts and abilities to help people and expand God's kingdom. It's joining what God can do. And God can do great things when we will rely on him. Remember what Jesus told Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Thriving people are free to serve God. Thriving people are free to look to what God can do. And to do it well, we, we must not be ignorant or brash. We must be wise and innocent. It says in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And that's what our text shows us. There's three things I want to encourage you to remember and take note of. How it is we can be wise in serving God. The first is this. Thriving people serve God wisely when we use our influence for God's purpose. When we use our influence for God's purpose. Think about what Mordecai was doing. He was using his influence in Esther's life to call her to serve God's purpose. And look what he was challenging her to do. He was saying, Esther, use your influence. You now have influence. Use that for God's purpose. All of us, every one of you in this room has influence. You have the capacity to impact other people's lives. I always love it when children say, well, I'm just a kid. I don't have any influence. And I just want to say, you know, your parents were normal before they met you. They were happy, easygoing people. You've completely changed these people. This is what children do. This is what we all do. We have the power to influence other people. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself. What are you doing with your influence? You have it. What are you doing with your influence? Is it helping other people? Is it it helping expand the kingdom of God? Or is it about you? Is it about what you want? Is it about your comfort? See, God, God is at work, and He's calling us to join Him. As a matter of fact, He's given us a specific role. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our role. That's your title. You are an ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And make no mistake about it, God's going to win. I don't know if you've read the end of the the Bible. God wins. And he's going to do great and awesome things. And he's calling us to be a part of it. But to be a part of it, we're going to have to give up some things maybe that we want. And, and, and always remember this. It's a privilege. Everything that you get to give up for God is an opportunity for blessing. It says in Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him but also suffer for His sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Friends, we are one day going to give an account for our life. Now, if you're a Christian, I have good news for you. You will not have to give an account for your sin. Your sin has been completely paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And by faith, you have received the benefit of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So your sin is now as far from you as the east is from the west. You will never be held liable for your sin. It is paid in full. But what you will be held responsible for are your actions of service or your lack thereof. You are going, saint, you who used to be a sinner, now you are a saint. You will be held accountable as a saint. What did you do with your life? How did you serve God? You want to be like the people in Hebrews chapter 11. Go back and and read that list of people and look what happened. They were willing to serve God even though it was hard. And they were remembered for it. They were celebrated. It's the Heroes Hall of Fame in heaven. You're going to want to be like Dr. Bill Daniel, who sat right there in that fourth pew every Sunday at 8 a.m. For, for all the years that I served until the Lord took him home. Dr. Bill was faithful to teach his fifth and sixth grade class. He was faithful as an elder. He was faithful as a missionary. He would go on behalf of, of Living Hope to, to faraway places to preach the gospel. Do you know what he's mostly known for? And a lot of people will, will remember this. Dr. Bill prayed for every one of his patients before he, he ministered to them. Many of you are nodding your heads because you remember and you've heard stories and many of you were cared for by Dr. Bill and how he would submit himself to God to be of service to you. This man 
was celebrated in heaven. I know that I know that the day he died, he heard, well done, good and faithful servant. We also have a sweet couple in our church, uh, Dave and Judy Anderson. They're two of my favorite heroes in our church family. If you have children, you probably know exactly who they are because they've taught in our children's ministry for years. I cannot tell you how many times uh, Miss Carrie and I have gone to sporting events to see our children only to find Mr. and Miss Anderson there cheering on the children, telling them how proud they are of them and loving on them. Just a few weeks ago, I saw them at the baptism at the creek some of their children that they had served and certainly been praying for that they would be saved were making public profession of their saving faith in Jesus Christ. And there they were celebrating what God had done. It's not hard, friends. It's just a matter of making ourselves available. Sometimes, and I should say this honestly, it's not hard to say yes, but sometimes it is terribly challenging to fulfill the commitment. Uh, David Brainerd is one of my heroes of the faith. He was an 18th century missionary here in North America. He uh, sought to take the gospel to Native Americans. And he died at an early age. He died in his 20s. And his entire ministry, he suffered with depression. And the thing I always admired about him is that he never asked first, how do I feel? He asked first, God, what do you want me to do? His biography written by Jonathan Edwards is one that I probably annually, at least once a year, read sections out of to be inspired by his faith commitment to overcome how he felt to serve God no matter what. Friends, we have a choice to make. As saints in Christ, we have to choose. Are we going to listen to our feelings? Are we going to listen to our doubts? Or are we going to obey God? Are we going to lean into what God is doing and choose to join Him and serve Him? Understand, yes, there's going to be challenge, but every challenge is an opportunity to prove your faith and be strengthened in Christ, like Mordecai and Esther. And all these I've, I've shared with you. We all have a purpose, and God is doing something. We can be a thriving people who do what God's called us to do. Secondly, thriving people serve God wisely when we use our opportunities for God's mission. When we use our opportunities for God's mission. This latter part of verse 14 is a very famous quotation. As a matter of fact, someone recently, I saw them give, uh, someone gave Shakespeare credit for this. This ain't Shakespeare, people. This is Jesus, all right? This is the word of God. Look at the last part of verse 14. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Each of us has the opportunity to serve God right where we are for such a time as this. God put Esther and Mordecai right where he wanted them. You didn't choose your family. You didn't choose your abilities. You didn't choose your spiritual gifts. They were given to you. You are where you are in the house where you live in the, in the places you're from and in, in the opportunities to be at school or at work or uh, amongst the neighbors that you have. This is God's will. God has put you there for his purpose. And you have a mission. If you're a member of Living Hope, you have a very simple mission to impact your homes, your neighbors, and every generation with the hope of Jesus. And our mission as a congregation is based on the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. Remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the more personal form of that in 2 Timothy 2, 2, and what you have heard me, uh, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We are all called to be ambassadors for Christ, to use our life to share the hope that we have, to use every opportunity. At, at Living Hope, we have a simple way of doing it. Show of hands, how many of you have ever seen or heard me teach three circles? Show of hands, show of hands. Yes, most of you. Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up if you ever heard me teach it. Okay. Who of you could come up on the stage and teach it to the rest of us? Very few. Now, why is that? Why is that? Because you're not sharing it. Here's what I know. If you share something every day, you're going to know it, and you're going to be able to tell it anytime. You're going to be able to tell it at any point. 
I told someone recently, if I sneak into your house at 3 o'clock in the morning and shake you awake and say, draw me three circles, you better be able to do it. (laughs) We should know it. It's that simple. We've been talking about this for over a decade. There's someone sitting in the room right now who is keeping up the statistical data of how many times I say it a year. I say it a few times. And the reason is so that we will have the confidence to share. But can I tell you, I was recently tempted not to share my faith. Isn't that crazy? See, while I was about to share, someone said, oh, you're just a pastor. That's why you're doing this. He said, you're selling me Jesus the same way my insurance person tries to sell me insurance. And I thought, well, that's not true, but I don't want it to come off like that. And I started to to back off. And, And then I thought, you know what? I know people I've trained in three circles and three big things who say, you know what, I I can't share this because I'm not a pastor. See, that's some of your excuses right now. You're thinking, well, I'm not a pastor. I can't. And I think to myself, well, I am a pastor. I can't share. And you're thinking, well, I'm not a pastor. I can't share. And don't you know the devil just delights in our unwillingness to lean in, to be where we are, to share what we know, and to be ambassadors for Christ. Friends, we've got to stop. Stop with the head games. And just do what God has called us to do. He has called us to take advantage of the opportunities. And here's your mindset for such a time as this. For such a moment as this person who's in front of me who's hurting. For such a moment as this time where I'm going to have with my child to ride in the car. I can go over three circles and three big things. For such a time as this, I can take this opportunity and I can serve God's purpose. Last, thriving people serve God wisely when we use our obedience for God's glory. When we choose to obey. There's three things I want to note to you and for you to see in the text, beginning in verse 16, that we all are to do. The first is, we are to always pray and occasionally fast. Look at the first part of verse 16. Hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. There are times when we need God to know that we are so very serious that we don't want to focus on anything other than him accomplishing his will and purpose. And so we not only pray for it, we fast. We fast and we pray. We also have to be willing to sacrifice. Look at the last part of verse 16. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. There is no greater freedom than that which the apostle Paul spoke to in Galatians 2.20, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And let me remind you, Christian, of what you said at the confession of your baptism. If you've repented and believed the gospel and you've been saved, then you need to be baptized. And if you have been baptized, let me remind you what you told God. You told God that you were trusting Him to forgive you of all your sins and that you would live the rest of your life in obedience to Him. And that obedience was pictured in that baptism because you were buried with Christ. Your old life is over. You died to authority over your life. You have been made pure and raised to walk in a new life. Friends, some of us are not living as those who've died to our flesh to live for Christ. As a matter of fact, many, it seems, have died to Christ to live for the flesh. Because we don't do what we're called to do. We do what feels comfortable to our flesh. Friends, we are responsible to fast and to pray, to sacrifice in our service, and then to do our part and rely on others to do theirs. Look at verse 17. Look how this ends. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. See, that's what happens. Those of us who are in Christ, we serve God and we're trusting that others are serving God and together we all serve God together. We are one body. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 18, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. I don't think we understand this well enough at Living Hope. As a matter of fact, I came under conviction this summer as I was watching many of our members begin to back away from their responsibilities as covenant members of the church that I need to do more to instruct our congregation what it means to be living hope. So beginning this month, I am going to begin along with one of our elders, Charlie Fortney, join join with Pastor Jeremy, our membership pastor, in instructing our membership in what it means to be members. And so what we're going to offer, and if you will look on your electronic bulletin that many of you are fighting against, you're not going to win. 
You're not going to win. Go to the electronic bulletin. You're going to notice on November the 7th, we're offering a class. It's called Membership and Ministry. And what a glorious acronym, M and M. (laughs) Now, just guess what we're going to have for snack at the M and M night. Oh, yes. Oh, is it going to be glorious. Lose some weight because we're putting on some pounds that night, my friends. I'm just telling you right now. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be living hope. We're going to talk about what is membership. We're going to take a tour of the building. And then we're going to talk about ministry. We're going to talk about how each of us have a role and a responsibility. Now, if you're not a member, it's time for you to stop dating us. And it's time to enter the covenant of membership. And you need to register and do that now. Now, some of you are not being faithful covenant members. And I want to encourage you to come. Say, well, I'm already a member. Yes, but I want you to renew your commitment. If you're floating, if you're not in a group, if you're not serving in ministry, then you, I want you to come. And again, we're going to do these regularly, but while it's hot, while it's fresh on your mind, come and, and hear about this. Renew your commitment because everyone is needed. I know sometimes we think, oh, Living Hope's such a big church. They, they don't need me. They, they've got all that big stuff. You know, sometimes we think about the church the way I do the Titans. The Tennessee Titans, if you watched the game the other night, you were probably at the end of the night, you were probably talking about one guy, Derek Henry, six foot four, 250 pounds. Woo! Look at that guy run. I don't care what you say, that's art. But you know, here, here's this guy, before he could make that run, someone had to snap the ball. Someone had the block. See, all the time we just, we look at the superstars and we think, well, that's what makes, that's what makes... Living hope is made up of many parts. And if everybody doesn't do their part, we're, we're not going to do well. I mean, the same is true in that European trash sport, soccer. I mean, look how many people touch the ball. I mean, one person can't come down here and, and, and provide the header. No. You, what do you got to do? You got to pass the ball. There's multiple people in multiple positions doing multiple things to Bam! Concussion and score, right? And, and, and it's, it's, it's just in fun things, too. I mean, look at this. Look, look how fun this is. How, how does this work? He does that, and he does that, and he does that, and he does that so he can do that. <laughs> now, the one kid could have just put it in, but there's no fun in that. No, no, no. It's moving the ball. It's everyone playing a part. Friends, can I tell you, if your Christian faith is boring, you're doing it the wrong way. Christianity is many things, but it is not boring. If church life, if church life, if the whole church life for you is showing up, listening to a sermon and leaving and only doing the parts that you want to do, you're not doing this right. Am I stepping on some toes yet? Friends, Christianity is a family sport. Christianity demands under the lordship of our king that we all serve his purpose that you rely on on me, I'm relying on you, and together we get to do what God is doing in the world. Remember what serving is? It's joining God. It's joining God in what He's doing, using our gifts and abilities to help people and expand God's kingdom. Some of you are not doing that. And that needs to to change today. Now, Now, some of you can't because you're not a Christian. Some of you can't because you won't commit. That needs to change right now. Let's all stand together as we do and ask our care leaders to come forward. And let's, let's pray through this this morning. Let's pray through what we need to do this morning. At the end of the service, these care leaders are here to, to speak with you and pray with you and counsel you. But let's first talk to the Lord about what you need to do with you. Let's pray together. Father God, I I know that you are faithful to accomplish your purpose. And Lord, I know that your purpose is to bring glory to yourself by turning sinners into saints and then having those that you have redeemed serve your purpose and to bring glory to your name. But Lord, I know there are some here today, first of all, they're not saints, they're still sinners. And they can't serve you because they're serving themselves and they're dead in their sins. And and Lord, they're responsible for those sins and, and, and they are under your wrath. And I pray that today they would repent and I pray that they would come and talk with these leaders at the front and that they would choose to follow you, Lord Jesus, and be saved. Father, I know that there are many saints in this room today 
that, that this is a foreign concept, what I'm speaking to. They know it hypothetically, but not really. And, and Lord, there's no other reason except that rather than serving you, they're, they're serving themselves. And they're allowing their doubts and their fears to guide their decision-making rather than their faith. Lord God, I pray that you are bringing conviction to the hearts of those that you have called to be living hope and they would commit to this life. If that's you today, remember, right now in your heart, confess that you've not been faithful. Maybe you've not been tithing. Maybe you've not been serving with your time, faithful to pray, faithful to share the gospel, to know three circles so that you can say it in your sleep. Repent, repent, commit yourself, commit yourself to Christ, commit to being a reliable member of this body. Lord, I am so glad that you're at work in the world and we don't have to come up with stuff to do. You're already doing it. We can lean into what, what it is that you have for us. Give us the faith, Lord. Enable us to overcome our doubts and to serve even though we doubt. And we promise we will give you the praise for it. We ask this in the powerful name of Christ our Lord. Amen.